Yo, yo, once again, we are back at it. Sorry for the delay. I don't know. Man, it's crazy because one of my phones, one of the phones that I was originally going to use, don't got the live option no more. That's crazy. I'm going to wait for y'all to get in here. Uh, this is a disclaimer. We're going to play some music. So this is my disclaimer. Um, I do not own the rights to this music. This is uh, for educational purposes only according to the Fair Use Act. And here we go. Wait till y'all get up in here and enjoy some music real quick. So my uh, brothers, shout out to my AOC brothers. Y'all did y'all thing on this one. Come on in. We finna get, we finna get it. Shalom, brother. Brother Oza, shalom, family. Shalom, shalom, uh, grace and peace, family. Glad y'all can tune in today. We got a special lesson today. Yeah, it's going to get serious today. Give me for that. Once again, I want to give all honor and praise to the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Holy One of Israel, who is Jesus. Now, I told y'all last week that we gotta we gotta deal with something that's real serious today, right? And what I mean by that is is that it's getting to the point, it is really getting to the point in these last days where the Lord is pouring his spirit out on us, right? All the stuff that was hidden um, um, according to the famine of the land, the famine of the word of God in the land is being revealed to us more and more. And it's getting to the point where we don't have to use what you call cliches to prove that we are Israel. We are indeed the children of Israel. Genetically, based on oral tradition, based on archaeology, based on ethnology, based on uh, anthropology, all these things, we can steer away from the religious thought right, and deal with this with academia, right, straight academia, so all the terms that I just named, we are going to get into that, this is going to be a little different, because what we want to do is we want to shift the mind of how people are looking at the Bible, right, nothing is going to change, everything is going to stay intact as far as the word of God, the only thing is this is a history book, Y'all understand that? It's a history book. It's a book of anthropology, science, all these things in this book. It's not a book where you just go to church every uh, uh, Saturday and just sit there and fiddle your thumbs until the next week. This is serious, right? 
So let's get some definitions up here, right? So we are going to start with archaeology. And the reason, like I said, the reason I'm doing this is when we go through this lesson, right? When we go through this lesson, you are going to be able to see each example of these definitions put in this lesson. It'll get to the point you don't even have to point it out. Once we go to them, you're going to know that this is what this is according to the definition, right? So once again, we're going to start with archaeology, the definition of archaeology, which is the scientific study of historic or prehistoric peoples in their cultures by analysts of, uh, by analysts of their artifacts, inscriptions, monuments and other such remains especially those that have been excavated right this is archaeology right so it is the science that we're doing science here we're not doing any religion right we're doing science so it's the scientific study of historic or prehistoric peoples in their cultures by analysis of artifacts inscriptions monuments and other such remains especially those that have been excavated now, we are going to go to oral tradition because these are the things to prove whether you come from these people or not. Let's not play around. The, 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 shalom, shalom, cuz. Um, so, like I said, we're not, we're not, we're not going to play around with this, right? This is how you find out whether you are people in the academic setting, right? So, let's go to the next one. The next one is oral tradition. This is originally how the Bible, before it was written down by Moses and other scribes, this is originally how the stories of the Bible were passed down from generation to generation. By oral tradition. Definition of oral tradition, and this is from dictionary.com. Definition of oral tradition is a community's cultural and historical traditions passed down by the word by, by word of mouth or example from one generation to another without written instruction right peace israel so that is what oral tradition is right all of these things will be used together to prove the point right you can't use them separately then we're going to use the scriptures as well as well let's go to the next one the next one is ethnology. Ethnology, another way to prove whether you actually come from a people or not. Uh, ethnology is a branch of anthropology that analyzes cultures, especially in regard to hi their historical development and the similarities and dissimilarities between them, right? Or another, or another definition is a branch of cultural anthropology dealing with the origin distribution and distinguishing characteristics of a human society, right? So ethnology. Y'all want to make be mindful of these words, right? Cuz we're going to we're going to get into a whole different thought process. Right? Last one. Anthropology. Got a couple of definitions. Anthropology. Anthropology is the science that deals with the origins physical and cultural development, biological characteristics, and social customs and beliefs of humankind, the study of human beings' similarly, similarity to and divergence from other animals, the science of humans and their works. So science is what we are going to base this whole thing off of. Not religion, but science. It's all them atheists, all the 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 comedics, all your urban apologists, we gonna we gonna deal with this so there ain't gonna be no uh, questioning who the children of Israel are. So from this lesson, this is called all eyes on Judah through the Yoruba people. All eyes on Judah through the Yoruba people. Right. We're gonna start this at Isaiah the tenth chapter. Now, once again, remember those definitions, family. Remember those definitions, because as we're going through the prophecies, we're going to go through history and everything else, so you'll know we them people. It ain't, ain't no denying it. And we don't have to use Deuteronomy 28. We're going to also show that as well. 
We don't need to use Deuteronomy 28 as our primary source. We don't need to use De uh, Leviticus 26 as our primary source. We're going to just stray away from that for right now. Once again, we're going to start this at Isaiah, the 10th chapter. Isaiah, the 10th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 5. Isaiah, the 10th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 5. Verse 5 reads, O Assyrian, the rod of my anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Now, once again, if you know the history, which you're going to get into, if you know the history of the Assyrians, how they just came and destroyed nations, the Lord God of Israel said that the staff in the hand of the Assyrian is his anger and indignation, right? He's proclaiming it. So this spirit that is on them is based on his anger, right? And this is going to get scary too, right? He said, the staff in their hand is my indignation and the rod is my anger. Verse 6, I will send him against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him, char give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets, right? Uh, verse 7, how about he meaneth not so, neither does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. Now, look at that. The, the Assyrians didn't even know that they were being pushed with this, based on their own free will, of course, right? God is not going to... Uh, uh, make somebody do something and then turn around and punish them and he made them do it. No, this is based on their own free will. They wanted to do this anyway, but the problem is they thought they were doing this on their own. They didn't think, they didn't even suspect that God was pushing them to do this, that the spirit of his anger was in them to do this, right? So they're going to destroy nations, not a few. That's the first nation we're going to deal with is the Assyrians, right? The Assyrians, right? Let us go to Jeremiah the 50th chapter now. Jeremiah the 50th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 17. Jeremiah the 50th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 17. Now, once again, this is the Lord God of Israel bringing this upon the earth. His spirit of his anger against a hypocritical nation, which we're dealing with Israel, against a hypocritical nation, right? Now, let's um, let's see what we're dealing with right here. Uh, Jeremiah, the 50th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 17. Jeremiah 50 and 17. Verse 17 reads, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria have devoured him, and last, the, uh, and last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, have broken his bones, right? So we know that the Assyrians took out the northern kingdom, right? Completely took out the northern kingdom. We know that the Babylonians completely took out the southern kingdom. Here's where it gets tricky, though. In the midst of this, there's little detail that is going to show where people went, right, and other people getting captured, right? And what I mean by this is even though Assyria took out the northern kingdom, right, they also went after Judah. Now, they didn't take down Judah completely, but they took Judah's defense cities and the people that were in those defense cities, they took them captive. According to this, and according to um, their, the, Assyrian, um, the Assyrian records, right? Let's go see that. Let's go see that. Let's go to 2 Kings, the 18th chapter, right? So we got the Assyrians, um, the Assyrians being pushed by the anger and indignation of the Lord. And then you got the Assyrians taking out Israel, the northern kingdom first, because we got two different kingdoms. And then you got the Babylonians coming by, taking out the southern kingdom, right? So let's start with Assyria, of course. Second Kings, Second Kings, the 18th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 9. 
2 Kings, the 18th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 9. 2 Kings 18 and verse 9. Verse 9 reads, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Shalomancer took Shalomancer, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. Uh oh, words kind of small. Verse 10. And at the end of three years, they took it, even in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is in the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. So we are, once again, this is Ju all eyes on Judah, but we want to make sure we know the separation here. So we don't get confused with the separation, right? So Shalomancer came and took out Samaria, or the northern kingdom, right? Now let's see where he placed the northern kingdom. Hold on, y'all. Hey. All right. Let's see where he placed the northern kingdom. Uh, verse 11. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in, and put them in Halah, and in Habor, by the river of Gozan, and in the city of the Medes. That's where the northern kingdom went, right? This is where the northern kingdom went. Now, when we start doing this, the southern kingdom got taken as well. Some of the southern kingdom got taken as well. Just not the entire southern kingdom, right? They got taken as well. Let's see that. Well, let's continue, though. Verse 12, why did they get taken? Here's the biggest thing. And this is the, the salvation within this lesson. You're seeing all of this happen, and it happened because we didn't keep the commandments of God. We didn't hold on to our salvation, so this is happening to us, even unto this day, right? Verse 12, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded and would not hear them, nor do them, right? So we didn't want to hear them or we didn't want to do them, right? So we got taken out of our land. We got put out of the land, right? Or in other words, we got put away, right? Let's keep going. Verse 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib of Assyria come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them, right? So he came after the fenced cities of Judah and took them. He didn't take out all of Judah, but he took out the fenced cities or the fortified cities, the ones where they have um, 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 their soldiers and as far as war and everything else. He took out the, their cities, right? Let us continue. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me that which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 of gold. Now, we read that to show that one of the places, which was one of the famous places in Israel, was Lachish. Right. One of the famous fortified cities in Israel or specifically in Judah was Lachish. And we're going to show what Sennacherib have said versus what this had, you know, this has said. He gets a little more detail, but it still matches up and we're going to see it. Right. Um, let us continue. Now we're going to Second Kings, the 19th chapter. Second Kings, the 19th chapter. Now we remember we saw that Shalomancer took out the northern kingdom. But Sennacherib took the fenced cities of Judah, right? And we're pointing this out for a reason. It's going to lead into the oral tradition of the Yoruba, right? Of the Yoruba. Um, so we're going to 2 Kings, the 19th chapter. 2 Kings, the 19th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 5. 2 Kings, the 19th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 5. Verse 5 reads, So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, 
And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall, thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, uh, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and he shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he heard that he was departed from Lachish, right? So, Because he already took down Lachish. He's moving on because he's starting to go to each of the fence cities. And eventually he's going to try to take over Jerusalem, right? But he's, he's not going to be able to take Jerusalem down, right? Yo, what's going on, bro? Shalom to you. So once again, he's going after the fence cities. He's trying to take down all of Judah, right? Because that's just the pride in these Assyrians, especially with Sennacherib. They trying to take down Judah completely because they were destroying all the surrounding nations that they came across, right? Let us continue. Uh, verse 9. And when he heard say uh, of Taharka, king of Ethiopia, behold, he is come out to flight against thee, and he sent messengers again unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered uh, uh, into the hand of the king of Assyria. Y'all see that? This was blasphemy against the God of Israel, right? Once again, we read in Isaiah the 10th chapter that they didn't even know they was doing this. They didn't even consider what spirit was behind them that was leading them to do this. So he's sitting here saying, let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, as if he's doing this on his own. He ain't, right? He's not. Let us continue. Now, now, now a rumor was going to be sent against him by Taharka, king of, uh, king of Ethiopia. And we know at this time, Taharka is still ruling in Egypt, but this is the 26th, uh, 25th dynasty of Egypt that was taken over by the Cushites, right? So that's why you got Taharka, king of Ethiopia, right? So once again, he blasphemed the Lord and he think he's doing this on his own. Let's skip down to verse 32. Verse 32 uh, and continue. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city nor shoot an arrow there nor come before it with shield, nor, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same way he shall return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. Now we're, we're going to establish what place he came from and where he's going to return, right? Uh, let us continue. Verse 33, I mean verse 34, For I will defend this city to save it, for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that that night that the angel of the Lord went and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and four score and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So, of course, he tried to encamp the uh, Jerusalem so he could take it down. And usually when they do this, this is a form of starvation tactics when they're encamping you so you can't go in and out, right? They did that in 70 AD with the Romans. Titus uh, encamped Jerusalem so they can starve the people out, so they couldn't come in or out, right? Um, let us continue. Uh, verse 36. Oh, also, in secular history, you can see that these soldiers, 185,000 soldiers, that encamp Jerusalem. We're not going to get into that um, specifically, but secular history said that a pestilence came and took them out, right? This says that an angel of the Lord came and took them out. That should be on somebody's mind, right? That we should not be afraid of the pestilence because if the pestilence is out here to destroy us, that means the angel of the Lord came and did that, 
right? So if the angel of the Lord wasn't sent to you, you're not going to die from the pestilence. I just wanted to make that a side note. Um, so let's see where Sennacherib came back from, right? Verse 36. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt in Nineveh. That is what he came back from, right? He dwelt in Nineveh, right? Verse 37. And it came to pass as he was, as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrach, his God, that Adremelech and Sherezar, his son, smote him with the sword. And they escaped into the land of Armenia. And Asardon, his son, reigned in his steed. Now, y'all got to look at that. God is a man of war. I'm, I'm telling you, he is a man of war. And this is why I say this, right? So he's going around. Sennacherib went around. And he was bragging and boasting that none of the gods of the other nations, right, could uh, 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 could save them from his attack, right? And, and, and he's boasting about his fathers, how they didn't destroy nations. Now he's coming to Hezekiah like, uh, let not thy God in whom you trust deceive thee. So the boasting was there, right? Now he went back to his land and started praying to his God. And guess what? While he praying to his God, his son's coming there to kill him. Y'all see how it don't matter. And he was in his crib. Y'all see how it don't matter where you are? It don't matter uh, 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 how, what you try to hide from. It don't matter what God you try to pray to. The God of Israel, when he has your number, you going to get dealt with. It don't matter. Now you see he blasphemed the, uh, uh, the king of Assyria, blasphemed this uh, the God. And then guess look, you uh, see what God did to Sennacherib, right? It happened to any one of us, any one of us. Now, let us confirm something. Let's go to Second Chronicles, the thirty-second chapter, right? Because we said that he started in Lachish, right? When he went to Judah, and Sennacherib had eight campaigns, right? When he was going out doing his battles. He had eight campaigns and uh, Hezekiah was his third campaign, right? This is all in written. Y'all can look this up. This is all in written history. Uh, history. So let us continue. So, uh, Second Chronicles, the 32nd chapter. Second Chronicles, the 32nd chapter, and we're going to start at verse one. Second Chronicles, the 32nd chapter, and we are going to start at verse 1. Verse 1 reads, After these things and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib of Assyria came and entered into Judah, right? And encamped against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself, right? All He, he thought to win all the fenced cities. But of course, what we read is once he got to Jerusalem, all that was over with, right? Verse 2, and when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was gone and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with him, with his princes and his mighty men to, uh, and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city. And they did help him. So there was, a, uh, there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and, and, and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water, right? Because that was stopping them from coming in and completely uh, demolishing the, the land of Judah, right? Let's skip down to verse 9. Verse 9 reads, After this did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants to Jerusalem, but he himself laid siege against Lachish and all his power with him. So we're establishing that he laid siege against Lachish and all his power with him. But remember, he took the fenced cities and the people in it. We're going to see that when we read his account, right? Um, unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, and unto all Judah that were in Jerusalem, saying, 
Thus saith Sennacherib, king of Syria, whereupon do ye trust and that ye abide in the siege in Jerusalem. This is talking about trusting in God that he's not going to um, uh, protect Jerusalem. The same blasphemy, right? What we wanted to point out is he laid siege to Lachish and that he took the defense cities of Judah. Now, let's go to some archaeology, right? Remember when we said that, right? We're going to some archaeology right now. And we are now dealing with what is called the Lachish Reliefs. Y'all can go, um, this is in the British Museum, but also if you live in Chica the Chicagoland area, you can go on 57th and Woodline to what you call the Oriental Museum. These artifacts are in that museum, y'all. We've been saying this for a while, but we, it's finally getting out that these artifacts, because I know people, uh, 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 especially the Kemetics, Egyptologists, stuff like that, they want tangible evidence, right? They always telling you, well, where are your uh, artifacts? Where are your bodies at? Where are your carvings and stuff in the museums at? Well, guess what? They're there. So ain't no more talking about that. They're in these museums, British Museum, they're in the Israel uh, 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 the Museum in Israel, the Israel Museum, and the Oriental Museum that is on 57 and Woodline in the Chicagoland area, right? So we're going to read what is on the Lachish Reliefs, which the excavators found in Nineveh, right? And this is what Sennacherib said about Hezekiah and Judah, right? So remember, the Bible says that he laid siege to Lachish with all his power and that he took the defense cities, just like Shalomansa took the northern kingdom in the areas uh, uh, Hala, Habor, by the river Gozan, in the city of the Medes, right? So Sennacherib took these captives of Lachish and um, in, in Judea uh, period, in Judah period, and he took them back to Nineveh when his army got taken down, right? Because he returned to Nineveh. But he still had his, what they call his spoils of war. He still had them with him. He just didn't get Jerusalem. Y'all follow me? This is what he said. And this is in the Lachish release. This is uh, according to uh, the, the site is uh, et cetera, ancient, um, ancient um, dot EU. Right, this is uh ancient histories and etc. Right, you could just pull it right on up on the internet. If I had screen, if I had the uh screen share, I would show y'all this. But um, let's see what he said. This is a quote from Sennacherib. He said, Because Hezekiah, king of Judah, would not submit to my yoke, I came up against him. And by force of arms and by the might of my power, remember the 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 the, the scriptures say in Second Chronicles that he laid siege to Lachish and all his power with him. So he says himself, he says, by the might of my power, I took forty six of his strong fenced cities and of the smaller towns which were scattered about. Excuse me. I took and plundered a countless number from these places. I took and carried off 200,156 persons, old and young, male and female, together with horses and mules, asses and camels, oxen and sheep, and a countless multitude. This is a quote on the Lichish reliefs from Sennacherib. Y'all see that? He said he took, remember the Bible said he took them, right? Once again, just like Shalomansa took the northern kingdom, he took the people in the defense cities where he laid siege. He didn't get to Jerusalem, though. Now he's saying that all these, uh, 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 out of the 46 uh, stronghold fence cities, strong fence cities, he took 200,156 persons, right? Back to Nineveh with him. We're gonna we're gonna conclude that right with another one. This is L the Lachish release with this quote on here. Right now, let's confirm that he took them back to Nineveh. Right. 
Let's confirm. Now we are going into this book called The Negro Question, Part 2, by Lee Cummings. We're going to use this a couple of times, just so y'all understand. Right? This is, this is The Negro Question, Part 2. Um, the whole book is called The Negro Question, Part 2, The African Slave Ships That Came From Judah. We're going to see all of this in this lesson, right, by Lee B. Cummings. So, Lee Cummings points out that on what you call the Sennacherib hexagonal prism or the Taylor prism, archaeology, y'all see this, right? This is dealing with archaeology. These are quotes on these monuments when they deciphered the cuneiform on here, right? Lee Cummings points out, he says, on page 23, he says, I am not going to write everything that I that was found on this prism. Of course, he ain't got time for that or time capsule. But I will reveal the treasure that has been saved here. The prism states that Sennacherib took captive Hezekiah's harem, daughters, male and female musicians back to Nineveh, my royal city. This is what the uh, 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 Taylor prism or the, it's also called the Sennacherib hexagonal prism, right? You can find this in the museum as well, in the Oriental Museum as well, if y'all want to check that out, right? Uh, he goes on to say, for you Bible scholars, right, out there, the musicians that came from the tribe of Levi, uh, the musicians came from the tribe of Levi, and on the next page, I have the, provided for you what a Hebrew Israelite looked like before the so-called European Renaissance period. We're not going to get into that. If you get this book, this is a pretty good book. If you get this book, the next page you'll start showing you what the people that were seen on the Lakish release, they were carved in there, what they look like. And of course, they look like us, right? So that does it. On, we got Sennacherib according to the Lakish release. We got Sennacherib stating how many people he took back. And also he said in the Taylor prism or the hexagonal prism that he took them back to Nineveh with him. Right? So he took the fence cities. Right? The Bible says he took the fence cities. The Bible says that he laid siege to Lachish. Right? What's the name? The name of the book is called The Negro Question, sis. Once again for y'all, The Negro Question Part 2. The Negro Question Part Two, and we're gonna we're gonna be using this uh, a couple of times in this lesson. So, you got the ta the Taylor Prism saying that he took them back to Nineveh. Pointed out, if you look on there, you'll see uh, uh, instruments on the carving showing that they were the musicians, right? And usually, like I said, the musicians were the Levites. So we know what they we know we're dealing with Judah at this time, even though. You had Levi spread across, across all 12 tribes. But right now we're showing that Sennacherib went to Judah. You got Levites that he took with him and other tribes that he took with him in the southern kingdom, right? And he told you the number in the Lachish release, and he told you in the Taylor prism he brought them back to Nineveh. Nineveh, right? Let us continue. Now we're going to Nahum. Sorry, excuse me. We're going to Nahum, the first chapter. This is going to get real interesting, y'all, because once again, we can see that God is dealing with these nations. When he says something, his word is not going to come back void, right? It's not going to come back void. Nahum, the first chapter. Nahum, the first chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. Get that. Nahum, the first chapter, and we are going to start at verse 1. Nahum 1 and 1. Verse 1 reads, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserved wrath for his enemies, right? So obviously, he's mad. He's pissed off at Nineveh. We're going to see why. 
he's pissed off at Nineveh. We all see who was the, 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 the capital of Assyria was Nineveh at this time. We all see who went back to Nineveh and what he did. Now, the, the, uh, uh, what happened in Nineveh is things were just getting all out of whack. All the idolatry and witchcraft, which we're going to read, was just getting out of control. And God had to take these people down, right? For his righteousness sake. Verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all equip the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in his storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet, right? Now, you know how he feels about Nineveh, right? But who was Nineveh oppressing at this time? And it's going to make sense. How did they get there? How did they get to the point where Nineveh was oppressing them? Skip down to verse 15. Verse 15 reads, Behold, upon the mountains of upon the mountains of the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace. O Judah. Who is that? Judah was being oppressed by Nineveh at this time. Now we saw where the, the northern kingdom got taken. It was not Nineveh. Who got taken back to Nineveh? Judah. Who was God talking to when, as far as showing that Nineveh was oppressing them and that they should, um, they should keep good, bring good tidings, publish peace? He said that to Judah. Let's 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 uh, 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 specify and emphasize that he said that to Judah. Right? What did he tell him? He said, "Keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee." He is utterly cut off talking about the Syrians, talking about Nineveh, right? Because Judah was being oppressed. How did Judah get to Nineveh? Through Sennacherib. Through Sennacherib. Let's keep going. We're going now to Nahum, the second chapter. Nahum, the second chapter, and we're going to start at verse 8. Nahum, the second chapter, and we are going to start at verse 8. Now, now we're really dealing with Judah, right? We gave Israel, we showed Israel to show the, um, um, the difference between them and the difference of the areas that they went into. And now we're just dealing with Judah, right? Verse 8. Nahum, the second chapter, and verse 8. Verse 8 reads, But Nineveh is, uh, Nineveh is as old like a pool of water. Yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is none in of the store and glory of all the pleasant furniture. Because, of course, she went around and she just took captive all these different nations, right? But once again, we're dealing with Judah. So it says Judah was going, I mean, Nineveh was going to flee away, right? Meaning they were going to flee away from off the map, from off existence, because this was a powerhouse at this time, very popular in the nations at this time. But who else was going to flee away, right? Let's go to Nahum, the third chapter now. Nahum, the third chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. Nahum, the third chapter, and we are going to start at verse 1. Nahum 3 and 1. Verse 1 reads, Woe to the bloody city. It is full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. So he's going to get into why God is so angry with Nineveh, right? Verse 2. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the, pr uh, the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of slain and of a great number of carcasses. And there is none in of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses, right? So this is what's going on in Nineveh at this time. Real bad stuff, right? Verse, uh, verse 4. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms 
and families through her witchcraft, right? Because people are adopting the Assyrian religions. And Judah and Israel, right? But we did them with Judah. Both of them adopted the Assyrian uh, kings as their religious rulers. So that's when, when you finally get down into Africa, you will see all of this um, um, ancestral worship that they got from Egypt, that they got from Assyria. You can go read that in uh, Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, where they um, fornicated with the Egyptians and they fornicated with the Assyrians. So they took their gods as their own, right? So that pay attention to that because that's going to be key and when we break this down and connect everything, right? So I'm going to skip down to verse 7, 3 and 7. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for thee? So the people that are in Nineveh, right? Nineveh is going to flee away. And the people that look upon Nineveh that are in Nineveh are also going to flee from Nineveh, right? They are also going to flee from Nineveh. Now, let's look at this prophecy being fulfilled. Let's look at this prophecy being fulfilled, y'all. Hold on. Bear with me real quick. Here we go. So, we're about to read the history of the fall of Nineveh. The fall of Nineveh, right? And this is from... Uh, dailyhistory.org how did the ancient city of Nineveh fall you can uh, look that up on Google or whatever um, so we're going to start here it says for centuries the Assyrians were able to impose their will on the other peoples throughout the Near East through a combination of efficient brutality and superior battlefield tactics and tech Technologies. Didn't we uh didn't we read that in here? That they the noise of the whip, the horsemen and all that, that they came to war with the peoples of the Near East, right? They use they said they use efficient brutalities and superior battlefield and technologies to run this and take over these nations, right? Now, of course, if the Lord's anger and indignation is in these people. He had to provide this with them, y'all. Anything, anything that's allowed down here on earth, guess who allowed it? It doesn't matter if Satan is the one that's pushing this, is the spirit that's pushing this, right? Through Satan using God to push this, uh, I mean, uh, God using Satan to push this in these uh, people, right? If he allows it, it's going to happen, right? If he's calling it, it's going to happen, right? But this is why he had to take them down. Uh, let us continue. But by the 7th century BC, their neighbors had caught up in the most, in, in most of those categories. So eventually, um, the other nations caught up with them. In the ancient city of Babylon, a new dynasty of ethnic Chaldeans came to power which is known by the modern scholars as the Neo-Babylonian dynasty. This, this is the uh, 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 society that's going to take out Judah completely, right? Which we read in Jeremiah 50 and 17. Let us continue. And just to the east of Assyria and Persia, the kingdom of the Medes was adding pressure. The first Neo-Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, this is Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's father, was as aggressive as any Assyrian king and by all accounts just as politically savvy. According to the cuneiform historical text known as the Babylonian Chronicles, Nebuchadnezzar mustered an army of, at Babylon in 616 BC and marched north to destroy the Assyrians and Nineveh, right? And Nineveh. This is who is going to fulfill this prophecy. This is who the Most High is going to send to fulfill this prophecy of destroying 
Nineveh, right? It says, ironically, the Assyrians were saved by their own rival, the Egyptians, because the Egyptian, eventually the Egyptians came and aided them, right? Who led by their king, Saptic, the first, who was in the, um, who was the ruler in the 26th dynasty. Because when, um, I mean, uh, the 20, I'm sorry, this is the 25th dynasty, the end of the 25th dynasty, right? So, of course, he aided in the, um, the destruction, I mean, he aided in the uh, uh, battling of Babylon with the Assyrians, right? So, these Samtic were able to fight off the Neo-Babylonian attack. The Assyrian-Egyptian victory at Nineveh in 616 BC would prove to be uh, infernal for the king uh, Sinshar, Sinshar Ishkan, who was the Assyrian king at this time, um, though, because the enemies of Assyrians smelled blood in the water and were lining up to divide the spoils of the once mighty empire in order to build an effective alliance, Nebuchadnezzar's next reach out to an assortment of Assyria's enemies were led, were led by the Medes, right? So the Medes helped the Babylonians take down the Assyrians and the Egyptians, Right? And also you have in Ezekiel, the 29th chapter, where the Lord gave the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar. That's not all he gave, but I wanted to point that out. Um, let us continue. The Assyrian Egyptian, uh, no, I'm sorry. Nebuchadnezzar next reached out with the assortment of the Assyrian enemies who were led by the Medes, right? The strategy for the final victory over the Assyrians and the destruction of Nineveh involved a classical uh, pincer movement whereby the Neo-Babylonians attacked the cities from the south and west while the Medes and their allies covered the north and the east. This was the tactic of taking down Nineveh, right? The victory of the allies was completed in 612 BC as was the destruction of Nineveh, which is documented in the Babylonian Chronicles. So, prophecy fulfilled in 612 B.C. by the, uh, the Neo-Babylonians and the Medes under Nebuchadnezzar, king of uh, Babylon at that time, right? Who is Nebuchadnezzar's father. You see how all of this is connecting, y'all? Right? This is getting scary because the Lord called this, right? He called this. Now, let's go see. Um, let us go see this being completed, right? And what was Assyria also called? This is going to be uh, important as well. Let's go to Micah, the fifth chapter. Micah, the fifth chapter, and we're going to start at verse um, six. Micah, the fifth chapter, and we're going to start at verse six. Micah 5 and 6, it says, And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod in the entrance thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. Now, that happened, right? The land of Assyria is also called the land of Nimrod. The land of Nimrod. All of this is going to be very important once we start breaking down the oral tradition of the Yoruba. All of this is going to be important, right? Those dates are also going to be important as well. So we got one date is 612 BCE. The, uh, uh, when the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar took down Nineveh, right? We also have Judah... In Nineveh, taken by Sennacherib when he took down his fenced cities, in Nineveh, right? And those people that were in Nineveh, who was that? Judah, as well as uh, uh, other nations, but Judah was in Nineveh, and they fleed once the destruction came upon Nineveh, right? Now, and we're going to see where they flee to, because all this is going to start making sense, right? Shalom, brothers. So let us continue. So we see that the land of Assyria or the land of Nimrod 
was destroyed by the Babylonians, right? They were destroyed by the Babylonians. Let us continue. Now, let's go to Jeremiah, the 27th chapter. Now we're going to get into Nebuchadnezzar. So all of this time is going by subtly. We went from Sennacherib. We went all the way down to Nineveh. I mean, uh, uh, Sennacherib, dealing with Nineveh. We went all the way down to Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed Nineveh, right? Fulfilling the prophecy in Nahum. Now we're going to Nebuchadnezzar, right? Let's see what he's doing. Jeremiah, the 27th chapter. Jeremiah, the 27th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. Jeremiah, the 27th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 1. Verse 1 reads, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus, thus saith the Lord to me, Make thee bonds of yokes, make thee bonds and yokes, and put them upon thy neck. Right? Um, let's skip down to verse 5. So, this is God telling them, Look, I'm about to appoint Nebuchadnezzar to be the ruler of the world, pretty much, right? And I want all of y'all to uh, uh, put yokes and bonds under you, uh, uh, on you, on yourselves. Put yokes and bonds on yourselves and come under the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Let's read that. Verse 5. Verse 5 reads, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground. By my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given it unto whom it seemed meet unto me. Now, look at this, y'all. I'm going I'm to show the dates in here and to show you that these are prophecies. I'm going to show you that the Most High is talking to these people. This is not no superstition. He sends, like, he, like, like the other kings, they will, when they want nations to come and send messages to the other nations, they have their representatives. The representatives of God were the prophets, right? And they would go to the kings and tell them what God had said, right? So this was actually happening. This is why I say that this is scary because it, there were messages that were sent, not just to Israel, but all the surrounding nations that y'all got to come under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Let's see if they didn't, what was going to happen, right? Verse 6, And now I have given all, the, all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beast of the field have I given him also to serve him. And all the nations shall serve him and his sons and his sons' sons until the very time of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. So, of course, this is going all the way down to the Gentile dynasty, right? The sons and his sons' sons, and the, uh, his actual sons and the people that come from the Gentile dynasty, all the way down. So you got Greek, uh, Babylon, uh, uh, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, all the way down to where we are now. That's just a side note, right? Verse 8, And it shall come to pass, that the nation and kingdom which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith the Lord, with the sword and with the famine and with the pestilence until I have consumed them by his hand. Right? So he was the first Gentile king to rule the whole world, y'all. Right. And guess who put him in that power? God did. Telling everybody else to come up under him. Otherwise, he was going to consume them. Now, we're going to read the history of Nebuchadnezzar when he was taking down these uh, 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 nations, which is the Battle of Carchemish. That's when he took down all these nations. Right. But let's look at these dates. Right. So when we uh, in the beginning of this chapter. Right. This message went out in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Now, let's look at this. Let's go to Jeremiah, the 25th chapter. I want y'all to see this. 
Jeremiah, the 25th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 1. Jeremiah, the 25th chapter, and we are going to start at verse 1. We're not going to read this whole chapter. I just want to point out the timing, right? Verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon was 605 BCE. When, um, 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 so this would be the beginning, right, of when Nebuchadnezzar would uh, start to do his campaign and stuff. Now, in Genesis 20, uh, uh, Jeremiah 27, when the warning went out, it was the fourth year of Jehoiakim, king of, uh, 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 king of Judah, right? 605 BCE, the, I mean, uh, the fourth year of, uh, of, of Jehoiakim was 605 BCE, which means the first year of Jehoiakim is 609 BCE. These dates are very important, right? So now we got 612 BCE, we got 609 BCE, and then we got 605 BCE. All of this is dealing with Judah because Samaria got taken out in 722 BCE. So we know we're not dealing with the 10 tribes. We are dealing with Judah and Nineveh. We're dealing with Judah, right? So 612, 609, 609. 05. Those are going to be really important dates, right? Let's go see why. Now we're going into the history of the Battle of Carchemish. The Battle of Carchemish. This is the beginning of when Nebuchadnezzar is finally going to put his, his foot <laughs> in the bus of these nations, right? He's going to consume them, and it's the beginning of this is the Battle of Carchemish, right? Let's read the Battle of Carchemish. This is uh, 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 this is from the website www.patfield.com. Um, this is by David Patfield. This is the author of this uh, article. So the Battle of Carchemish. It says the Battle of Carchemish was fought in May June of 605 BCE between an allied army of Egyptian and Assyrians against the Babylonian army. Right. So the remember the Egyptians came to help the Assyrians at um, with Nebuchadnezzar, which was Nebuchadnezzar's father, right? But the destruction of Assyria did not happen yet. It was just the destruction of Nineveh, right? This, with Nebuchadnezzar, with the Babylonians, they're going to take out the Assyrians altogether, right? Let's see this. When the Assyrian capital of Nineveh was overrun by the Babylonians in 612 BCE, y'all see that? That's the second source that said that, right? Um, the Assyrians moved their capital to Haran, now in Turkey, to Haran, now in Turkey. When the Babylonians captured Haran, uh, Haran in 608 BCE, the Assyrian capital was moved to Carchemish. Egypt Egypt was allied with the Assyrians and marched to their aid against the Babylonians. In 609 BCE, the Egyptian army of Pharaoh Necho II was delayed at Megiddo in Israel by the forces of King Josiah of Judah. Josiah was killed and his army was defeated. Now, this is why, you see, 609, Josiah was killed. 609 is when Jehoiakim was, is the first year of the reign of Jehoiakim. Y'all see the connection? The first year of the reign of Jehoiakim is the year Josiah died, right? So we got, once again, 612, 609, 605. 605 being the fourth year of Jehoiakim. 609 being the first year of Jehoiakim. 612 being the destruction of Nineveh by Nebuchadnezzar, right? Let's continue. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the uh, temple, oh, I'm sorry, um, let's skip down, right? It's too much. It's not needed. Uh, the Egyptians were further delayed at Ribla, and Nico arrived at Carchemish too late. Ba the uh, Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had surprised the Assyrians and had captured Carchemish. 
He then turned on the Egyptians. Uh, he then turned on the Egyptians and thoroughly defeated them in a bloody battle. And and the combined Egyptian and Assyrian forces were devastated. The Babylonian Chronicles. Once again, we got the Babylonian Chronicles as a, a witness to this, right? Now housed in the British Museum, and it's also in the British Museum, right? Claimed that Nebuchadnezzar crossed the river to go against the Egyptian army, which which lay in Carchemish. The armies fought with each other, and the Egyptian army withdrew before him. He accomplished their defeat and beat them uh, to non-existence. As for the rest of the Egyptian army, which had escaped from the defeat so quickly that no weapon had reached them. The Babylonians overtook and defeated them in the, in the, in the district of Hamas, so that not a single man escaped to his own country, right? Because they were consumed by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. They did not escape to their own country, right? Let us continue. At that time, Nebuchadnezzar conquered the whole of Hati land, right? Uh, before the battle of Carchemish, Carchemish, Egypt had one of the greatest armies in northern Africa and was a threat to the Middle East, right? But the battle of Carchemish changed all that when the Babylonians destroyed the power of Egypt and the independent existence of Assyria. The battle of Carchemish was the end of the Assyrian Empire, right? And Egypt was reduced to a second-rate power. Babylon became the master of the Middle East. Prophecy fulfilled, y'all. Prophecy fulfilled, right? Didn't the Lord say that this was going to happen to these nations if they did not come under the yoke of Babylon? Now Babylon is the king of the Middle East. At that time, that was like the world and what was really going on in the world, right? So we have that. Six, remember, once again, 612, 609, 605, and then later on we have another migration of Judah, the, 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 the entire migration of Judah in 586 BCE, right? We are showing, we're seeing that this is Judah. This is Judah. Now let's deal with the Yoruba, right? We're going to bring them right on in because they are going to be the ones that show Who's fulfilling the prophecy on Israel's side, right? In real time, in real time, nothing fake, uh, uh, nothing fake, nothing fairy tales, right? I'm also going to point out this because it's a lot of brothers out there, right, who have this thing where we are not actually the children of Israel. We are just converts, right? We're converts. Two questions I want to ask, right? Before the Persian captivity, when did they convert? And when do you see any? Uh, uh, when do you see any proof of a conversion of nations before the Persians? Before the Greeks? Before the Maccabees converted the Edomites, the Idumeans, and things like that? When do you see a conversion? Also, when was there a mass conversion? of Judaism in Africa ever, ever. Until you answer that, these oral traditions, these prophecies, these archaeological findings, they are proving that we are Israel. And for those who like genetics, because we don't really deal with genetics, right? They're not, they're, not, um, um, they're not accurate. The only genetics I will deal with is who, uh, what people we came from in West Africa. It doesn't go farther than that, right? Because eventually that stuff gets diluted as, as time goes on, right? But who do we come from in Africa, right? Where was this conversion at? Until you answer that, we are showing oral tradition going back to Assyria and Babylon, right? So I want y'all to t ask, these, ask these people who want to say we converts, when was there a conversion before the Persian captivity? When was there a mass conversion or uh, a colonization of Judaism in Africa. You ain't going to find it. I'm going to just tell you that. You ain't going to find it. Now, let's go. 
get uh let's go see this oral tradition right now this is from a book by dirk lang called anthropos right anthropos this man has a phd in african studies right he's actually um 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 he actually grew up in east africa even though he's a german he grew up in east africa and he spent 30 years y'all 30 years studying the yoruba 30 years right building up um 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 building up documentation writings um, um, he used a, a scholar named Samuel Johnson, who's also Yoruba, right? And he showed that these uh, 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 these folks are viewing their history from the perception of the Israelites, right? Y'all can go on to his uh, website, dirtlane.com. Um, um, he has a load of stuff. You know, it's really like articles. They're articles. It's a whole book, but they're different articles. Uh, um, articles um, separated, but it's a whole book, right? So, this is what we're going to do. We're going to read from this article, this man who studied them. He also went to um, the summit that they had in 2010 discussing if the African Americans and the people of the Caribbean were the Israelites, and they tried to reject his, it was peer review. This is a peer review book. But it was rejected by the people because you got all these people that come from the Oxford schools or the Hebrew schools. Basically, you got he in there with Esau and I Ashkenaz, right? And, and when they see his work, they like, well, no, we can't, we can't look at this, right? Even with Samuel Johnson, right? He brought his work that showed we were the Hebrew, that the Yorubas were the Hebrews, to the uh, uh, um. To the missionaries uh, uh, commission, uh, commission, right? To the missionaries. They rejected him. His brother had to bring it out in the 1900s. He wrote it in the 1800s. But they rejected it. They do not want y'all to know this stuff, y'all. Right? So that's why we got to pull from different points, oral tradition, archaeology, to pull this stuff together so that we can prove who we are. They don't want us to know. It's that crafty council right so let us let's let's read this right this is uh from his book on page 579 579 he said on the basis of comparative studies between the dynastic tradition of oeo of the oeo yoruba and the ancient near east eastern history the present article argues that the yoruba traditions of provenance Claiming immigration from the Near East are basically correct. This is why he said basically correct, right? According to the OEO Yoruba tradition, the ancestral Yoruba saw the Assyrian conquest of the Israelite kingdom from the 9th and 8th century. That's the 800s and the 700s, which means they saw the fall of Samaria in 722, right? And they saw this uh, from what? They saw it from the view of the Israelites. So let's get into the detail of this, right? After the fall of Samaria in 722 BC, they were deported to eastern Syria and adopted the ruling Assyrian kings as their own. Remember, I stated that, right? They adopted the ruling Assyrian kings as their own, right? The collapse of the Assyrian Empire is, however, mainly seen through the eyes of the Babylonian conquerors conquerors of Nineveh in 612 BCE, right? This second shift of perspective reflects the disillusionment of the Israelite and Babylonian deportees from Syria-Palestine towards the Assyrian oppressors. After the defeat of the Egypto-Assyrian forces at Carchemish, now y'all see who we dealing with, right? Even though they saw the northern kingdom get taken down, right? The view is from Carchemish, which we know this is the start of Nebuchadnezzar taking down the nations. And who was there? This is Judah. Judah, right? So it says, after the defeat of the Egypto-Assyrian forces at Carchemish in Syria, 
In 605 BCE, this is when Nebuchadnezzar became king. This is also um, going back to um, Jeremiah, the 25th chapter, right? Numerous deportees following the fleeing Egyptian Assyrian troops to the Nile Valley before continuing their migration to sub-Saharan Africa. That is how we got down there. That is how we got down there. Now, this is this is a map. This is not clear, but if y'all need it, I, I can shoot you the uh, emails if you come into my um, inbox or whatever. This is that map, y'all. Just want to take the time if you can see it. This map is showing... If if you can't see it clearly, that's okay. Like I said, I will. Uh, if anybody wants it, I will. I will send it to them. This map is showing the migration from Nineveh down to Mecca to Yemen. Right. This for all the brothers uh, talking about. The, only the Yemenite Jews came down into West Africa, as far as the Hebrews. You better watch it with that, because. <laughs> That will open up a whole nother uh, 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 story, right? That that you'll regret even bringing up. Now, like I said, this map, sorry if y'all can't see it, but this map is showing them going from Nineveh, fleeing from Nineveh, going uh, uh, in 612 BC, going to Har Haran, and then Carchemish, and then fleeing into the Nile Valley, Egypt, Ethiopia, and then going over uh, uh, going over to um, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, right? So this, that is the map. This is, that is on page 581 on Dirk Lane's Anthropos book, 581. This is according to the migration of refugees of the collapsing Assyrian Empire, according to Yoruba tradition, right? Remember, he was over there for 30 years talking to them, right? Studying them for 30 years. Right, so he is credi credible, and his uh, uh, his documents are peer reviewed. Right, so we got through that. Right, let us uh, uh, let us continue with some more. Also, in the same book, on page um, um, this is on page five eighty one. I mean, I'm sorry, this is on page five seventy nine. 579 is the account of the first and only Sudanic author to provide precise information on the origins of the Yoruba, right? So this is Muhammad Bello. It says, the first and only Sudanic author to provide precise information on the origin of the Yoruba is Muhammad Bello, the son of the founder of the Sokoto Caliphate uh, uh, and his later successor. So this man was a Fulani from um, the Sokoto Empire, right? In his, in, in fact, Maesir, written in 1812, he included a brief account of Yoruba origins, stating that the Yoruba were remnants of Canaanites of the tribe of Nimrod. That, look, that sound familiar to y'all? We, we know why it was Nimrod, right? Because they adopted the Assyrian kings as their own. And we know why he's saying that they're a Canaanite tribe. We're going to see why they say he's a Canaanite tribe, right? Who were expelled from Iraq because they went to Mecca, right, in Iraq, by Ura B. Quantan, and who fled to the west before they proceeded via Egypt and Ethiopia until they came to Yoruba. Assyria was known as the land of Nimrod that revealed where the Yorubas migrated, right? Note that the Yorubas are considered a Canaanite tribe because they dwelt in Canaan, y'all, right? That's why they're considered a Canaanite tribe. Let's go see that, right? Let's go see why that is. Let's go to Psalms 105. Are we we going we gonna to sew this up, right?